This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Neil Cummins. <laughs> how are you, brother? Good, mate. How are you? Yeah, really well, thank you. So our scouts uh, grew up in Liverpool, ended up in Australia, ended up one of the most wanted men in Australia. It's a typical <laughs> scouser, if I'm honest. <laughs> Always fucking causing trouble somewhere. How are you, mate? Good, mate. Good, good. <laughs> That's why my dad tried to get rid of me from the fucking Liverpool, so I wouldn't be the same <laughs> <back> there. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think it's in your DNA, mate, there. Like, it's no... It's no a uh, secret I love the Scousers because they're mad bastards but uh, there's some amount of trouble makers <laughs> in there no matter where they go there's always trouble like I just oh, said earlier you were born in Liverpool went to Australia became most wanted man involved in a lot of bad shit you were a bodyguard you were a debt collector and like I said earlier you were one of the most wanted so fascinating story but before we get into everything brother I always like to go back to the start of my guests get a bit of understanding yep. about you where you grew up and how it all began Yep, yep, that's cool. Um, so I grew up in Liverpool in a place called Garston and Allison. Um, it was kind of like, a, it wasn't a rich area, um, but like, it was very, it was very common area for Liverpool. Like the dock, you know, like it was all the, um, towards where all the, the docks would come down and do all the, you know, the stuff but for the back in the days and all like that. Um, but my family were more well off than my mates. And I was ashamed of that, um, to tell you the truth, because like I could see what my my mates were living in. They were living in a, like a a four four house semi detached with like three bedrooms, and my house was a fucking detached house in um, Heighton in Roby. And um, not only one, only two people used to come to my house uh, who I trusted because they would never sh- like say anything to my mates back in school. So um, it's it's a, it's a weird situation because I used to tell everyone I lived in Allerton Garston and hang around there after school. But I actually lived in Heighton because, as I said, I was ashamed of it. Um, so I grew up, yeah, I, I didn't tell my, my mother and father that, you know, I, I used to rob cars and uh, go around with a few, you know, drug dealers and all like that and go around to um, start fights with other gangs from other fucking places in Liverpool. But to them, I was just a goody two-shoes. But when I was with my mates, I was I was a fucking, I was a rat bag. You know what I mean? So um, I, uh, I grew up all right. I was, I was into football a lot. Um, that, that was my main thing to do. Didn't work out, didn't pan out. Um, you know, I, I was on the pool's book for a while. Uh, went down to Bristol for a bit. Um, didn't didn't pan out. And that's what happened in the end. I came over this way and tried to make it here, but it didn't happen. You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah that's how, did it. You, how did you end up over in Australia? So what happened was um, my mother and father separated, and um, you know uh, she remarried and. Um, he wanted to always go over my stepfather to Australia because he had relatives over there. I didn't. I really didn't get on with him. Um, to tell you the truth, I, I really didn't like him. And um, I wanted to stay. Um, but my dad didn't want me to stay because he could see the people I was hanging around. I, he just thought I was going to end up in jail, you know, straight away. You know, like all my mates were, uh, were pro boxers uh, or amateur boxers, boxing for England. And, um, you know, we used to go around and, and terrorize. Like I was turning up at nightclubs at 14 years old. You know what I mean? Like my dad had nightclubs and, 
I was standing up on his front door and I was telling the doorman, I'm walking in. What are you going to do? You're not going to stop me. You know what I mean? My dad owns the fucking venue. You know what I mean? So it, it, that was that was the thing. But as I say, going back to where I left to go to Australia is probably the better life. You know, back then in 1992, um, you know, Liverpool was fucking a pretty shit place to be. And it's it still is, to tell you the truth. Like, I've been back so many times and I don't want to say that. I fucking, my mates still sit in the same part of the pub fucking now, fucking 32, uh, 32 years later. You know what I mean? They haven't moved. You know, I, I just feel like I go back in time every time I go back there. And I've just stopped going since 2000 and 2005, since my grandfather died. I haven't got back. Yeah, it's mad that it's, it's always in your DNA. Like, no matter where you go, you've still got that boisterous nature. I was the same. My dad was a, a bouncer in Glasgow. So I was going to nightclubs at 14, 15, Jack the lad, and just thought I knew everything. And that was my downfall because I just loved the nightlife. I loved the yeah. women. I loved the, the music. I just loved everything about nightclubs. It was just... I just felt alive when I was in there. I felt like yeah. a sense of freedom. But obviously yeah. you mix with the wrong crowds because I, I was so young. I hang around with older men and that was a, a bad thing because I seen the way they operated and it was it wasn't glorified, but it was something about that bad man image that just they kind of took me under their wing. They think they're protecting me, but seeing the shit that they done then destroys you because it's not normal. It became normalized yeah. the shit I was seeing, the people who I was hanging around with at a very young age. Did you see yeah. that as well? I've seen that with people that my dad used to fucking hang around with, like my, um, you know, um, my godfather was Charlie Scott and he was one of the biggest heavies in fucking Liverpool. You know what I mean? He took on the Cray Twins when they tried to take over Liverpool. You know what I mean? I'd seen um, other drug dealers and, uh, the, you know, the Smiths who were well known in there. My dad would play for a football team called the Allerton and it was just all gang members on the sideline watching the football. You know what I mean? And you go to somewhere like a, a place called Toxteth, and it all kick on on a Sunday afternoon because, you know, one crowd would come over and someone would fucking bell and the game would be abandoned because they were fucking knocking each other out. You know what I mean? And I, I always looked at people. I, I used to look up to my uncle um, my, my, on my mum's side, Kevin, because he was a fucking hard cunt. And, and, and I used to love hanging around with him because everyone feared him. And it was a great feeling, you know, when you were like uh, 12 to 14 years old, having an uncle who everyone feared when they turned up. It's not that I wanted... To be, well, I did want to be like him, I guess, but I just tried to, um, I idolized him in a way where it was a fear factor every time he walked through a door and it was great where I didn't have that. You know what I mean? As a kid, you know, I wasn't really a bully. I wasn't nothing. Like I could, I could throw him, but I wasn't, uh, go around looking for trouble. You know what I mean? Like my other mates who were boxers, they went around looking for trouble and they could knock it. You know what I mean? And it was only till I was 14, maybe 15, probably 15 when I started going around and not giving a shit and, and having a go with people. And then, yeah, but that's that's how it was for me back home. You know what I mean? I just watched everyone what, kick ass. Yeah. What did you do the first time you went to Australia? I actually um, I was playing football. Uh, I was playing football over there. I played it for about maybe till I was 25. I got a knee injury and um, uh, I broke my ankle on the same tackle. And then I, I decided after that, I'm just going to give it up. Um, I went to a place called fucking Wollongong, which was like a fucking country practice. You know what I mean? The, the place was fucking um, 10 years behind everyone. And um, it's, it's funny in a way because no one back then in 92 liked English people. You know what I mean? You, I came there and I wasn't, I, it took me about fucking four months to be liked by anybody. You know, I, I, even in my football team that I had, no one wants to fucking talk to me. You know what I mean? I didn't get why I was called the fucking, fuck off your pommy cunt, fuck off this. You know what I mean? I, I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. And I had got into so many fucking fights uh, on the on the football field, but because I just didn't realize why why they fucking hated me so much. You know what I mean? I thought it was my Scouse accent. I didn't really, I didn't know what it was. But um, yeah, I didn't like it. And as I said, um, I went back to boxing um, when, I, when I was about 25, 26. Got on the gear a bit. Um, and yeah, the, the rest was just fucking history. You know what I mean? I just wanted to be a doorman. I couldn't be, I, I actually wanted to be a DJ when I was uh, like, when I used to go to my dad's clubs, but when I got onto the gear and went back to boxing, I just wanted to be a dumb. That's all I wanted to be. See, when you say you were on the gear, you were on the juice, but you says when you started taking the juice, it actually made you calmer. Yeah, a lot calmer. It made me, it, I, I only get aggro when I'm not on it. And that's exactly. how I used to find it. I think it's because you, 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 you see that um, when I was on it, I was calm. You could see your body developing. You could see, you know, you, you, were, you were fucking strong. You look good. When you come off it, you, you you go on a downer, and you just feel like you know you can see that, you know it's when you go to the gym, you're not it's not happening what it what usually happens when you go to the gym. You know what I mean? Like you 
you don't get that pump. You don't, you, you like, I, I train twice a day. You know what I mean? And I, and I still have for, for the past 15 years. And if, when I get that pump, I feel great. When I'm off the gear, I don't go to the gym, man. I'm the crankiest fuck in the world because I just, I hate it. I, I like to feel like, a, you know, when I go there, mad pump, yeah, put on size. And you can, I know it's cheating, but the thing is, I can get to that, my goal within fucking six weeks instead of six months. You know what I mean? So that was always my, I, I, I was always anti-drugs. Don't get me wrong. When I lived in England, but th this guy introduced me to it. This one guy and fucking, it was the, I've got to say it was the best thing he ever did to me because it really changed my whole life. I, I, it gave me confidence. You know what I mean? My confidence was skyrocket when I took I got on the gear. What sort of stuff were you taking? <laughs> anything to get my hands on bro like it's, I'm, I'm, when i'm saying i was i was fucking like when i say i was taking gear i was like going through probably 20 mils um a week and probably a uh, hundred dynabolt tablets oral tablets a fucking week too i was i was popping probably 20 a day and then i'd, I'd fucking take five mils in one day and the next day i take three and the next day i take five i was fucking i was abusing it like i mean abusing it because i could see what it was doing and, you know, it was one day I come home from the gym and I, I I didn't feel that pump. And then I'd put another fucking three meals into me when I'd only just put five in maybe two hours prior to that. You know what I mean? I was, I did, I abused it. But, um, you know, a few things happened and, you know, where I, I started to realize I've got to calm down on it because my health went a little bit skyrocketed. I, I started to get that, you know, when you, um, you look in the mirror and you don't see the person that you think you are. You know what I mean? I looked in there and I just went, Fuck, I look skinny. I don't look and feel good. Um, yeah, I didn't. I came off it for about a year. Um, and that was the worst year of my life, probably, because um, I was on the downer probably every day. And I just didn't want to take it because I tried to clean myself up. And then when the doctor tells you, you know, you're, you're spitting up blood and you're coughing up blood, um, you, you take a back seat on it. You know what I mean? Yeah, especially when it starts affecting your health. Yeah. See, it, it, so it affected it affected my health a, a bit, but the thing is, my problem with me is, bro, I, I, I just think fuck it, I'll get, I'll get better. You know what I mean? I always thought, I always, to this day, I always think I'll get better. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. I don't need to go see a doctor. I'll, I'll cough up blood for maybe two weeks and it'll go away. That, that was my always my, that was me all the time. What was it like being a bouncer? Um, bouncer, I actually enjoyed. Um, it was good times. You know. Um, it was, it, I, I never wanted to be it for too long, but the, the clubs that I did, um, you know, I did, you know, I, I don't know if you've been to Australia. I was, I was down at Darland Harbour. I'd done that for two years. It's different scene to England. Um, you know, it's, it's very more professional than what it is in England. England's very rough. You know what I mean? You get back when I, well, back when I was what the, my dad had the clubs and I seen the doorman that they were, they were all boxers or, Ex, ex military or something like that, where they just come out the army and they, they wanted to do a bit of doorway. You know what I mean? They, they, and doorman would take on doorman from other venues. It didn't happen over here, man. It didn't. There was none of that bullshit over here. It was just very professional. Um, you know, I had I was in charge of the drug runs. So I was undercover at one of these nightclubs and I would just go around trying to find who was the main runners, um, you know, against triads, um, against, you know, um, Middle Eastern groups. Um, who were bringing in the, the drugs to the fucking one of the biggest nightclubs in Sydney. You know what I mean? And it was, I loved that for two years. I did that and it was a fucking great job. Just going in uh, undercover, watching them bring them in and fucking in, in cigarette packets. And they're all in fucking cigarettes, you know, uh, going outside to the cars and they're fucking got fucking thousands in their cars. You know what I mean? It's, it was massive, but I used to crush them in front of them. You know what I mean? When I found all the drugs, I, I'd, I'd make them cry. I, I used to have this, uh, it was called the, the magic garden outside this club. And we used to make them fucking crush. It didn't matter if they had 100, 200, 500 pills. I made them crush them. And just to make them cry. And then they go back to their fucking dealer with no fucking cash in their fucking pocket. Gears, the gear's expensive over there. You're talking 300, yeah. 400 quid for a yeah. gram. Yeah. Yeah. So did you see the prices, the difference from UK yeah. to Australia? Is but, that, back, but, it, back, but back then, I, it was more pills though, bro. Everyone was, was into the pills back then. Yeah, it was pills. How much was that a pill? Pill back then was uh well, you're looking at fifty, fifty-five pounds, uh, fifty-five dollars. Yeah, we start a lot. You're getting them for about ten quid back in the day here. <laughs> oh no. Were you uh, not thinking that were you not were you not have that street mentality though of getting your own gear and making a bit of dough over there? 
Oh no, I was I was I was never uh, one of them to make um, any deals. I wasn't that. I was a third party. I tell you where they are, but me, I'm not into that shit. I won't sell. I'm not, I'm not a seller. Never. Why was. is that? It was never in me. It was never in me uh, to to be a seller, to be a drug dealer. I didn't want to be that. You know, in the past, of because I've known so many. Yeah, I was put on Intel as one of the main drug uh, distributors in um, Sydney, but I was never a dealer. I just that was not in me to deal. I just they, I, I was against it. They can all do that. There's no way in the world I was going to go to jail being a drug dealer. No fucking chance in hell. It's mad because in the 90s with the bouncers, they used to just kick fuck out of people. Sometimes they used to beat the wrong person no, and they were straight down with shooters the next night or swords. Was there any of that sort of stuff in Australia or was it more calm? More calm. Very calm. As I said, I've, I've, I've seen that back in Liverpool and back here, there's, there's none of that shit. None of it at all. What sort of it's all, it's, 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 it's all bikies over here, bro. It's bikies, Middle Eastern groups um, and triads. You know, there's there a bit of Russians back in the um, the early 2000s, but that's it, man. There's no, there was no like what you see in England. What about the triads? How, how have they got a patch over there? They don't go around making too much noise. They never did. You know what I mean? And I got on with well with a lot of triads. Um, I let them do their business as long as they didn't cause any trouble. I don't want fucking, you know what I mean? And it's good to have them on your side. It's but over here at the moment, as I said, it's the bikey wars. That's the biggest thing over here at the moment. And I've and I've been looking and I've been looking now. It's 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 developing overseas, you know. And um, I remember telling my dad about uh, I was working for someone, and he found out that you know um, the Abrahams had links to bikey clubs, and he hadn't got a clue what a bikey was. You know what I mean? It was back in what two thousand fucking four. He didn't have a fucking clue what bikeys were. And it's it's still hard to to talk to someone back home and say, oh, you know, what what's a fucking bikey, Neil? Well, you know what I mean? I know it's getting quite big over there at the moment because I've seen in Marbella. You know what I mean? There's there's a big group in Marbella now. But um, as I said, the bikey wars over here is is pretty big. And a lot of them now, the big guns from the, the bikey groups and the, the gangs have moved over to Cyprus and moved over to um to Greece and all like that. And they're the controlling it from over there in Dubai and everything like that now. You know what I mean? But the, uh, apparently... But, uh, but a lot of them have been caught. Who are the biker groups over there? I think you've got the Hells Angels and stuff here. You've got, you got the Hells Angels. you got the Comacheros. Uh, you got the Finks, uh, the Rebels. Um, you got the Nomads. Um, so you, you've got the Banditos. You know what I mean? So they're your main ones over here at the moment. Yeah, but the bikers don't fuck about anyway either. Same as the triads. They're all, even the UK, they're always under the radar. You'll never see many of them in prison either here. Yeah, the triads always keep themselves to themselves, make their money. Yeah, well, that's what, because they're, they're, casino, they're very good. Yeah, you get into a casino and it's just all the boys fucking spending fortunes. That's the love gambling, love gambling. Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely <laughs> love it. Did you ever think about being a biker yourself? I've been offered um, numerous of times. Uh, probably the only time I've came close to that was probably back in, um, I'd say, two thousand and five. Um, and I was hanging around with um, a lot of comic heroes um, before I, I started working for John. And that was the closest probably I've got um, to being one, you know, because I, I was affiliated. I went everywhere with the, the national president, you know, uh, and then it just came to a point where I just went, nah, I don't, I don't want to be controlled. You know what I mean? And that's what most of them are. You know, they're controlled. You've got to go to the national president or the president of the club or whoever's in charge to do anything that you want to do. You know what I mean? I don't want that. I want to have the freedom to say, I can go left, I can go right. You know what I mean? And that's that was the whole reason why I, I never joined. So life's going good then. You're full of steroids. You're looking great. You're making a bit of money. <laughs> no trouble. <laughs> but you ended up involved with, is it John Abraham, who yes, they say is yes. one of the biggest families yeah, family, in Australia, underworld. He's always denied yeah. that. I don't think he's got any convictions. Is that correct? No, that's very correct, yeah. But it's, it's it's not that, it, like, it, it's his family. You've got to understand that. Like, um, you know, his brother, Sam, was affiliated and the national president, former national president of the Nomads Bikey Group. You know, um, so that was, that's something that you got to look at why the, the Abraham had a kind of a bad name. You know what I mean? Because of that affiliation. Um, John, very business-minded, very business-minded. Um, but as I said, when, you're, when your brother's the, one of the, national presence of one of the biggest bikey groups and you know they're at war with some bikies at the time well that's what happens in the end i suppose you know what i mean but um when i met sam for the first time um i, I wasn't working for john um that was in king's cross too and i was i was looking after a nightclub uh, called soho 
And, you know, I knocked out two of his boys um, one week and uh, they came down, about 40 of them came down to find out who who the fucker was who fucking knocked uh, his two uh, boys out. And, um, you know, as I said, I, I stood my ground because it was my venue. You know what I mean? I didn't, this was the first time I've been confronted by bikies. You know what I mean? And I wasn't going to back down because I wasn't in the wrong. I didn't think I was and I didn't give a fuck because that was my attitude when I was a doorman. I don't give a fuck. This, whoever wants to take me on is going to take me on. But they came down, I sorted it out. I told them the situation and we shook hands and he just told me, you know, this is his patch. That was it. That was the first time I met him. What was he like? Because uh, in your interviews before, you say he's only five feet eight, you would think. John, John's about John's about five foot eight, nine. Um, when don't... was your first meeting so, with him? My first meeting with John was when I um, I started on one of his nightclubs. Um, and actually, I'd only seen from a distance what he actually looked like. And... Um, I remember standing outside his club called DCMs and um, everyone said, oh, John's on his way. He's coming down the street now. He's just stopped off at one of his clubs up the top of the road and he'd be down in about two minutes. And then you see, you hear the Range Rover coming down the road and then everyone's just, you, you, it's just like one minute everyone's talking, next minute everyone's just fucking gone quiet. And then I say, what, what's going on? And he goes, John's coming. And then the Range Rover pulls up and, you know, the, the car loads, about four or five people grab out the car. And because I've, I've, I've kind of not ever seen him face to face value, I, I looked at his other bodyguard, Tongan Sam, and I thought, fuck, this must be him, man. Fuck the size of this cunt. And he had presence about him. But it was fucking the smallest guy in the fucking group who, who, was, the, who was the main man. So I, as I said, when, when he came and, and he shook hands with everybody, I'm just looking at Tongan Sam going, what the fuck? Like, this guy was like six foot five. And I'm going, fuck, he's wearing a brown, black, black leather fucking jacket, all the way, uh, leather jacket all the way down to his fucking knees. And he looked fucking like you know, somebody who you don't fuck with. And then as John came towards me, not knowing it was John, I just, yeah, put my hand out to him to shake his hand and yeah, yeah like that. And then he fucking stopped in front of me and he just goes, is that all you fucking got? And I just went, what the fuck are you talking about? And then he just goes, I'm John, John Abraham. This is my club. Oh, I, I felt like, a, you know what? I felt like that fucking big, bro. You know what I mean? Like the main man, I was ready because Tongue and Sam was next to him. He's a bodyguard. So I was ready for that handshake. You know what I mean? And then it fucking, it was, yeah, what a fucking way to meet somebody that you're going to work with for 15 years. <laughs> so how do you become a bod uh, bouncer to then becoming his bodyguard and very close with him? Did you have to? Is it, did it take steps to build trust, or was it yeah. an instant thing? No, no, no. It was it was a trusting. You know, I he put me in charge of um, all his nightclubs, um, head of security. So wherever I was, um, you know, I was on the front door. It was my decisions for everything. Sometimes I feel like sometimes he he put me in situations to see how I deal with them. You know what I mean? Like uh, his main club was DCMs. And that was the club that I looked after for a long time. And um, the the amount of um, situations we came across at that club, like drive-by shootings, um, bikies trying to get in. Um, you know, I I think I've been through everything at that club. And um, when that club closed down, um, he actually messaged me and said, you know, it's closing down. What do you want to do after this? And I just said, listen, I just want to be by your side now. And he just said, done. That's what I want you to do. But prior to that, I was already slowly coming by his side. You know, now and again, he messaged me, are you in the cross tonight? Yes, I am. And, um, you know, he'd, he'd say, well, come and look after me. I'm, I'm going to be at this venue. You know, he, while I was at DCMs, there's um, King's Cross. It's probably about maybe a K each side of the, so you go from one end uh, to the King's Cross fountain to the end where the Coca-Cola sign is, if everyone's ever been to Sydney. It's about a K. And um, he made me go there every night from Monday to Thursday to look after it. And I felt that was a kind of a test to, to make sure, like, you know, you tell me no one's allowed in uh, any of my venues unless they're, they're with us. Um, any any bikies who shouldn't be in the um, the King's Cross, tell them to get out. Otherwise, if they're all right, they can stay. But, you know, it was always, I think, a test to see if I could become who I became. Um and I, I think I did a good job. You know what I mean? I, I didn't back down from anybody. You know, there's a lot of, even his own brother has, has gone to kind of, he didn't put the gun to my head, but he went back to shoot me because I didn't let him into a club. You know what I mean? He told me to, to say to Sam and his boys, they can't come into one of his nightclubs. So I stood up to, to Sam. And when I stood up to him and said, mate, you can't come in tonight. You got to tell your boys to go somewhere else. John doesn't want you in here. Um, he went back to a, a club, picked up a, a gun, came to shoot me. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, because he said, watch this, I'll come back now. I'm going to fucking shoot you. And I, I stood my ground. I didn't move. 
You know what I mean? That and I'm, at the end of the day, I was John's boy, and if he tells me what to do, I'm gonna fucking do it. So that there were situations I was put in that were pretty scary. Why did he not want his brother in? Because when you have about fucking twenty bikies in there and they're all in colours or they're all fucking a bit rowdy, then you're gonna lose fucking customers from your nightclubs. And as I said, John's a businessman. You know what I mean? And can you imagine like being an eighteen year old kid and you're 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 new to the scene and you're new to fucking coming out to a nightclub and you see all these fucking bikies come in there and they don't care. Like they they're gonna come into the club and they they don't back down. They don't give a they don't even realize some of them that this is John's club. This is this, you know, you gotta behave. They just drink on, get on whatever they're fucking taking and run amok. And the, you know, I've got to pick up the pieces or the doorman have to pick up the pieces. Some of the doorman wouldn't were so shit scared to even say anything to them, they would just let them do what they had to do. You know what I mean? And that's where I step in, or someone else had to step in to say, listen, boys, you can't do this because they were too shit scared to do it. So that's why he didn't want him in any of his venues because he didn't need the fucking headache. Plus, the coppers were always on his case too. Was John's life ever in danger? Was was he always on the lookout? Oh. Is that why he had bodyguards? Yeah, yeah there was always there was always a hit that like it, you know, there'd be always you know a hit going to be put on him. You know, sometimes it it's it's happened, not happened, but you know, they've been kind of yeah, the hundred thousand to hit here. I think that was in two thousand and nine, um, but. When you've got, as I said, it comes back to his brother, who's a who's who's a big bikey boss back when then his clubs were fucking like what 18 nightclubs he had, all in his prime. And to, the way to get to someone who's in a bikey club is to get to John or the venues. You know what I mean? You can't get to them, it's a bit hard. So what do you do? You shoot down the club, you know what I mean? To to make a presence sound. That's how it always was there. Because you've had a few hits out in your life, were you not carrying your daughter, and somebody came yes. with a gun? Yeah, what that was that there? was when the, that was um, back when the bikey wars were on back in um, uh, two thousand and oh, I think it was seven, um, and um, I was just it was about eight o'clock, eight thirty at night, and I, I went to a place near Bondi Beach uh, to um, to go to shops, and my, my daughter was was she was young at the time, and um, I had her in a baby satchel which looks like, you know, it's it's like a, a long band bag. You know what I mean? And she was inside there and I'm walking around and then there was um, there was three fucking uh, rival bikies who spotted me and they just walked out the gym, the local gym. And um, I seen them. I didn't I didn't panic. I just kept walking, kept doing my thing. And um, they followed me to the car park. And as I got to the bottom of the ramp where the car park and there's no more cameras left, um, they went to pull a gun on me and fucking um, shoot me. But as I went to do it, I, I kind of I stopped them straight away. As soon as I seen the gun come out, I said, hey, you know what I mean? I've got I'm carrying a baby like that. And then one of them pulled the gun away and then threatened to say, well, you know, yeah, next time you haven't got it, this is what's going to fucking happen to you. So that's the yeah, that was pretty lucky. Do you ever question that and think what what's the purpose of you doing everything you're doing there, especially when it comes to your family being in danger? Uh now I do, bro. Now now I would. But back then, um, there was there was no fear factor. I didn't. I was there to do a job. Uh, I was I was there. All I had was who I am and what I had to do. And you know what I mean. Yeah, it, it shook me a bit, but then I switched back on to being who I was. You know what I mean? Because I, I, I it's hard to. I, it's not that I I didn't worry about you know that happening again. But the fact is. There's a code over here that, you know, and I know that code's been broken in the past couple of years, but where you don't shoot anyone who's with their family, you don't bring family into it, uh, you know, if you want them, deal with it with them by themselves. But, you know, I actually thought they would have known it was a fucking baby and I'm carrying a baby, but they fucking didn't, you know what I mean? But um, as I said, it, it didn't put me off. It never did. The only time I've ever I put myself off is when I put my own, when I put a hit on myself. That's the only time I've I've really been on a low point. Why were you so loyal to the one man? Um, why was I loyal to the one man? Because of the fact of that's 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 what I am. I am I'm I'm fucking I'm loyal. You give me a job to do, and, and I'm loyal. Um, he was a great person to work for. You know what I mean? I loved work looking after his his nightclubs. Um, you know, he looked after me. You know. He appreciated what I did for him at the clubs. I got on well with all his brothers, his whole family, um, you know, and that just grew on me. And 
you know, I got offers from other people to uh, to bodyguard them, you know, and it was bigger money. Um, and it probably would have been even better. I wouldn't have to look over my back and get shot. These people who were just fucking people who own nightclubs and they just wanted me to be their driver. But I said, no, I don't want to do it. I just want to be with John. That's it. You know what I mean? And that's that's how I am. I, it's, it's hard to question that one, bro, because I am. And to this day, I'm still loyal to him. Even though I'm not fucking working, anyone says a bad name about him, I fucking lose it. Because, you know, to me, he was like a brother to me. You know, it wasn't just a boss. He was a brother. Do you think he has some sort of power over you? When you look through it all, where you're loyal, you're willing to die, you're willing for your family to die as well, putting yourself through that, just to be loyal to the one man because you loved him like a brother. Listen, it's it's a noble thing, it's a it's a good thing, but when you actually break it all down, it is fucking crazy as well. Oh yeah, it is crazy. Don't get me wrong. Like I look back now, it's funny when I look back now and look at what I've done, gone through, and situations, I do go, what the fuck was I thinking? You know what I mean? Because you, you, I'm older now. I'm more fucking wiser. Um, you know, uh, I've got two boys now. Uh, so it's more like family orientated back then. I was young then. Um, but no, it's, um, I was just young. I was just younger probably. And I just loyal to, to him. It doesn't matter what it was. I would have knocked anybody out. I would have stood in the front of a bullet. As I said, I was there for a purpose. John can fight. John can throw him. But the thing is, I was, I was going to work. When all them um, rumors about there was going to be a drive-by or there was going to be a, he was someone's going to try and take his life, yeah, John would stand there, didn't give a shit. But the thing is, I was ready for it, and I, it was a fact in my head that I was ready to take that bullet. You know what I mean? I would take that bullet for him. That's probably why I lost my mother. You know, I haven't spoken to my mother in fucking what fifteen years because of it. That's mad, Neil. But again, that's just your nature. Did it feel like you were part of a family when you were with John? Yeah, it did. It was a family that I never had. You know, I, it was like, that's a, that's a, you know, when I was abandoned by my own mother, um, not once, but twice. And I came and I've been in Australia without a real family. Yeah. You know, when, when you turn up and you, you get looked after, even though it was, I'm not saying I, I go around for this for dinner and all that kind of shit. But the thing is, it was just the fact that I felt wanted. You know what I mean? And that's what I, and that's probably why I, I was so loyal to him because you know I felt wanted, and he, he made me feel wanted. You know what I mean? And he made I, I felt I felt good. There was a lot of power in what I had. You know, I could walk around anywhere in Sydney, even go up to fucking Queensland, and everyone knew who the fuck I was. I'm not to fuck with me. You know what I mean? Because of that power system that I had. You know, there, there was a lot of yeah. It was it's 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 a weird feeling, bro. Very weird feeling when you when you're in that kind of circle. Yeah, a sense of a sense, like you said, sense of power. But having that, I don't know if that's abandonment or whatever. But to have that, then family unit that you've always wanted a bit of power, somebody who wants you, ha not having that stability with your mum, then we crave it externally. For me, it was drinking drugs and all the other stuff. That felt like a family to me. Hank doing the wrong stuff because I didn't want to upset the people around me because I didn't want them to leave me either. If you kind of yeah. get what I mean, like yeah, 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 yeah. It's, to feel wanted is such a good thing is but it can be for the wrong reasons as well which is mad how many hits did you have out in your life neil um i would have said probably about maybe well you had the one drive by that was a hit on me then i had, then i went back to um then i was followed home and i had the fucking hit on me during the week so i'd say about two or three it's still scary did you how are you how's your paranoia now Oh, nah, there's no paranoia now. Well, since I've left, you know, I don't have to watch my back. People people now who I was fucking back then and enemies with, I can talk to now. And they've come up to me and said, Neil, there was no, don't take it personally. It was never just a personal thing on you. But the thing is, you have to look at who you were working for. You know what I mean? And we had to, sometimes we have to take out the main person who looks after that main person that we want to get to give out a sign that, you know what I mean? So I, I get that, you know what I mean? But no, nah, I can talk to everybody now. <laughs> I'm a, you know what I mean? I don't have any problems anymore. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I don't, it's just a weird how I could walk away and people were, yeah, asking me to join up their gangs, which I wasn't going to do, but they were also shaking my hand. You know what I mean? And and just saying, listen, you you were, you were loyal as fuck. We understand that, but um, you have to understand why we did what we did. So that's how it was. Why do you think these people in big families making some serious dough never actually leave? Why not just make your money and fuck off? 
Because <laughs> it's a power thing. It's, it's mad, just like, back, it? it's it's just like mad. back in England. I see all the same families and they and they just keep going, keep going. And it's like they have kids, grandkids, and it just keeps going up, building up. They just do it. It's a power. They always, it'll always stay there. It's power and greed. Power and greed. Because I've interviewed so many people from that life and nobody ever gets out, ever, without... <laughs> actually sitting on the beach smoking a big cigar made their millions and actually enjoy life it's either the stress of the then their family the stress they've put on their grandkids because the grandkids then want to live up to their reputation it just becomes a vicious cycle until one family gets took out and then another one steps in there's nobody i know in that life who's actually made it out and done okay they've actually done well from it who've maybe escaped prison escaped all the hits they either get took out of prison there's not many there's probably one man in Glasgow that probably has, but out of thousands, thousands, and the percentage of actually doing well from that life is 0%, basically. But I, I always see people who, who either lose a family member from being shot, and you think, maybe this is it now. This is They're going to stop now, and it doesn't happen. Then you get someone who goes in for fucking jail, and you think, this is going to this is gonna stop the family, but it doesn't do it. They, they just want, they either... What happens is that one of the family members, maybe the son gets shot and they want retaliation and then it fucking builds up more and more and more. You know what I mean? So it never, ever stops. They mourn over here. Like, it's funny. I've, I've lost so many friends and enemies who, who were friends over the last five years who've been fucking assassinated over here and you, you think this has got to end now and it doesn't. It just gets worse and worse. Worse. What's the sentences over there for murder? Oh, you, you, you don't get life, put it that way. You don't. They're, they're, they're out within fucking some time for murder, but maybe fucking tops. They're out within ten years, fifteen years. What? There's no, there's no fucking thing over here. So some of them get away with it because it's all they fiddle it to wait to to another way, or there's no that they, they they pay off somebody. It's there's not one. I know once someone's in there for twenty years, that's it. It's the the the, the system over here is fucked up. Yeah, for any totally cold blooded cold-blooded murders here you're talking 25 30 35 now yeah and it's but it's sense. worse over there i wish people would see how bad it is over there compared to here like th this is like yeah it's getting bad over here but like growing up and i still know how it is and I, I still get people telling me how bad it is and i still watch the news to see how bad it is it is fucked up over there you know what i mean like Kids, as I said, like one of my mates I only spoke to in Liverpool not long ago, and he says, you know, there's kids of nine years old, 10 years old going in with fucking weapons into their schools. You know what I mean? That's unheard of here. Unheard of. Yeah, it's getting that, it's getting that way. It is. Slowly you can see it's getting that way. But not. It's that's been happening over in Liverpool or England for fucking years. Do you think it's happening that way because so many of the British are moving to Australia, or do you think that's not <laughs> nothing to do with it? No, there are a few over there. Like they go coming over here, but nah, it's not. It's it's the Middle Eastern groups that it's that's that's where it's starting over over here. You know what I mean? But they, but one minute they're all friends, next minute they're against each other. And as I said, it, it, all this comes down to is greed and power. They don't want to be told what to do by that certain person because why should you tell me what to fucking do? You know what I mean? So then they break up, get another gang, and then they're against each other. It's it's pretty fucked up. Is the Albanians over there? Yep. Yeah, they're fucking everywhere, and they don't fuck about either, Neil. You know that yourself. <laughs> There's some scary bastards. When they say they want you, they get you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But as I said, I wish, I wish a lot of them over here would see how fucking bad it is over there. Like, as I said, my, my father was very good mates with Colin Smith. And he was, he was, um, Colin was fucking the right hand man for Curtis Warren. You know what I mean? And like, that was huge for me to go when I was going over to see Colin. I've known Colin since I was a kid. You know what I mean? I know all his family. And to see that and what, what happened to him. Like, my dad, when he got assassinated in speak in Liverpool that night outside a gym, my dad was supposed to be with him that night. And so today, my, my dad still thinks it's a, it was a, it was a big setup. You know what I mean? And it was hard for me to take because, I, I all I had was pictures of Colin when I used to walk down the street and he'd say hello to me. You know what I mean? And but for who he came, like the, one of the massive drug dealers, uh, importers for fucking the whole of the UK was huge. You know what I mean? And I, it, it's funny how I know this is wrong to say this, but I used to look up to him and I fucking probably still do when he was a fucking drug dealer. You know what I mean? It's funny how I can say I look up to someone like that. 
I don't know why I can say that. It's very hard, but I, I did. I don't know. Maybe I, I'm, I'm I'm twisted. I don't know, but it's it's a weird sense of yeah. I I used my my uncle used to be a dealer. I looked up to him, but as I said, I looked up to the way he was a fucking hard cunt. You know what I mean? I wanted that power. I, I really did. I I I I envied him, and I think that's why when I came over here, I didn't take shit from nobody. You know what I mean? For for six months, I was I was kind of bullied in a way where no one wanted to know me. And then I thought, you know what? I'm fucking. I'm from Liverpool. I should be fucking doing something about this. And then I did. I just turned, and I fucking remember the first fight I went into. I walked into fucking a changing room into someone's. Um, after a football game, and I went in and I just fucking landed a punch on this fucking guy's face and said, don't ever fucking say that to me ever again. You know what I mean? And then it just started from there. I erupted. I just went, you know what? I went on a rampage every fucking weekend. What was your dad saying? He's thinking, you're in Australia, going to live a good life, have barbecues, buy a softboard, but yet you're getting hits over in fucking Australia. Nothing you'd been probably safer staying in Liverpool. <laughs> I, I, I kept it from my dad for years, what I did. Are you um, ashamed? Not that I was ashamed. It was just a fact of, um, and yeah, yeah, because he, t you know, he told me I was coming over here to get away from that shit. And then um, because my mother, I was by myself at the time when I was working, um, when, when he found out, he found out of somebody, some, some heavy he reckons was living over here and apparently found out that I was bodyguarding John, got back to my dad. And I remember the phone call. It was on a Thursday night in, um, Bars on King's Cross, and it was about fucking after midnight, and this fucking private number kept ringing me and ringing me, ringing me, and I thought, fuck, who's this? And I rang it. I was my fucking dad, and he goes, "What are you doing?" And I said, "Just walking around." And he just said to me, are "You working for some fucking uh, someone called John Abraham?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah. How do you know?" And he just goes, "Because I've fucking been told." What's this fucking bikey shit? And he just, I said, I, I tried to explain everything and tried to get off the phone to him, and then he just goes, "You know what? If you want me to, I'll bring some fucking heavies over there and I'll show you who the fucking gangsters are." He says, fucking get out of it, will you? And I, when he'd done that, we stopped talking. That was the day me and my dad stopped talking. And we only fucking started talking again when my grandfather died. Because I just thought, I'm not listening to you. I don't want to listen to your shit. I've already had it off my fucking mother. I don't need it from fucking you. And I just, I abandoned both. That's it. And I went on, on along. That's it. Can you see that they were actually trying to look out for you now, though? <sighs> my, my dad... My dad, yes, because he's been in that industry and he's seen it. I can, and I should have listened more to my dad. But my mother, no. And I'll, it's hard. To, and I know anyone when I say this, for a mother to turn around to her son and say, once you leave that door, you are dead to me. You are dead. I mean, you are buried. I, I thought, or oh, whatever. And then when I walked out the door, she says, Neil, you don't, you walk out the door and tell me you're still working for John. You're dead to me. I mean it. And I said, so be it. And then she told all my brothers, my half-sisters and brothers, that um, if you talk to them, you're off the will. I'll wipe you off the will. And that's how it's been ever since. And I just, as I said, I can't forgive that. I'll never forgive her for saying that to me. She could have had, she could have said it in different words, but she didn't. I, at the end of the day, you have to look at it like this, James. If, if I was bodyguarding the prime minister, I could get shot that way. If I'm, pri if I'm looking after someone who's high profile, I could get shot. Just because John Abraham and his family are in the news for being underworld figures doesn't mean I'm carrying a gun. You know what I mean? I'm going to shoot someone. I'm there to protect. Maybe a prime minister, maybe John. And that's how I tried to tell her. But she wasn't having any of that. And that's what that's what ended in the end. So, Does that upset you? Oh, deep down, it upsets me because, as I said, I've, I've had no fucking mother for God knows how long. I've had no father. We've only just started talking, me and my dad. Again, um, you know, that was hard for me. Um, but my mother, I'll never forgive her. And so every day I, I, I look at my, my, my two kids and go, well, they haven't got a grandmother. You know, I, I, I don't have a mother to speak. I don't have a, my, my, my half-sisters and brothers to talk to. You know what I mean? But she didn't mind ringing me up sometimes if she needed something dealing with. You know, someone that put it on one of my sisters or uh, she needed me to deal with something who because uh, she had a business back then who owed her money. I'd come down and be, be the heavy. But all of a sudden, like, she wants to put in, like, oh, you know, you shouldn't be waiting for John. Why, why are you getting shot at? You know, because at the time, my, my car was shot at. And I had, to, um, I think it was about seven or eight bullets put through my car. And that's why she just, she asked me to come down to see her. And that's how when she put it to me. You know, um, if you're not going to leave him, then you're dead to me. Did John know you had gave up your mum and dad for him? No. 
No, he does now because I wrote it in my book, but I never told him. I never told him. Do you think you've got too much pride, Neil? Yeah, probably. Probably have. Um, but I just felt like it's it's really none of his John's business. It's my business. You know what I mean? That's my family. I don't need to crowd in with all, you know, my mum doesn't talk to me anymore because I work for you. I feel like a fucking kid in school. You know what I mean? Like uh, going up to the teacher. You know what I mean? He's picking on me. No, nah, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. When did it all come on top for you? Because were you not suicidal at some point? Yeah, uh, that was that was 2009, 2009, just what before happened? 2009. Um, I think it was just everything, you know, as I said, I didn't have no family. There was a massive gang war. I just had, you know, like that just happened with, um, I've been stopped by three bikies and when I had my daughter and there was just a lot of tension around everything. And I just felt like, I was losing friends, uh, friends who were once I was friends with, and now because the, the, now they wanted to be a rival gang against me, and I just all and plus my marriage at the time was breaking up, and um, I was just in a in a in a rut, and I didn't know. I tried to to take pills to 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 take my life that way, and I couldn't do it. I was thinking if it doesn't work, I don't want my fucking uh, my stomach pumped. Um, I wasn't the type to to fucking slip my wrists. And then I just thought, you know what? Easiest way to do it. I know a few people who fucking can do a job with a gun. And I just said, you know, I, I went to this guy and I, without me fucking saying like too much, I just turned around and said, listen, there's a, there's a person I need fucking dealt with um, badly. Um, and I need him put away. And that person was me, but he didn't know that. I told him where I was going to be, what he looked like, what he'd be wearing, what time he'd be there. And I was ready. I remember the, the, the whole day was going so slow that fucking day. Um, and I, I kept going to the park during the day where it was going to happen, looking at the the bench where I was going to sit, and um, I was ready for it. I was I was actually very ready. I was prepared. Um, I was playing with my daughter all day, and I remember when it was time for me to to leave. Um, instead of taking the car where I usually take the car, I I said I was just going to walk to Kings Cross, which would have took me maybe forty minutes from where I used to live, and um. Yeah, I just sat in the park and, and waited. That's it. It was the longest wait of my fucking life. What happened? Uh, um, I remember hearing a few footsteps and, and then all of a sudden um, I, I, I wanted to look back, but I didn't. And I just kept looking at the grass in front of me. And then all of a sudden I, I got a fucking massive smack to the face. And I just, you know, I... I wasn't expecting it because I was just expecting someone to shoot me. And then all of a sudden I got this massive smack to the face. And then I looked around and I seen it was my mate who had asked to do it. And then he fucking hit me again in the face and he told me, don't ever fucking make me do this again. And he, 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 I don't know. We, we stopped talking for a while. We don't bring it up too much. Um, even now when I see him, um, but he just, he said, I, I knew there was something wrong. He says, cause it's not like you to ask for something like this. Um, and, you know, I was very wary. And when I approached, you look familiar, Neil. You, you, you've got a presence about you. You know what I mean? You can't hide who you are. And that's, he said, I know it was, I knew it was you straight away. And then that's why I fucking hit you. And he says, don't ever make me do that again. And I, I, I broke down. I remember I just, I was fucking, I went for a walk for about two hours. He tried to try, ask me why I wanted it done. You can, I can talk to you, talk to my mate, talk to anybody by me, and you're trying to explain why you're taking your own life, and you can't. You know what I mean? They can't understand that. But you're the only person who can understand why you want to take your own life. And at the time, I was just in a rut, and I, nothing was going right for me, and I just didn't want to deal with the shit. I just didn't want to deal with it. So I was an escape. Family and friends that you weren't yeah, here because there was so much yeah. pressure on your life. Yeah. I just felt like, you know, I was I was bad to everybody, you know, like no one likes me doing what I do. Um, you know, my marriage was breaking up. Um, would I see my daughter again? Who knows what I do? You know, none of my mates are talking to me anymore because now they all want to fucking against me and want to shoot me and want to have a fight with me because I'm working for who I am. Um, I had p people who are coppers who used to play uh, football with me, didn't want to talk to me anymore. It was just like, what the fuck's going on in my life? And I couldn't deal with it. You know what I mean? And as I said, everything was just on top of me, on top of me. And I just thought, easy way. I can't, I can't kill myself. Get someone else to do it. How much do you think about that, Daniel? Oh, I think about it a lot, man. 
I think about that day, it's funny how you, you think about a lot of things now in a different aspect and yeah, it comes up and it gives me, it gives me goosebumps when I do think about it because I remember that, that's that bench in the park, just sitting there and it, you know, it felt like fucking hours and it was a lonely fucking wait because I didn't know where, how, when he was going to shoot me and how he's going to shoot me. And when I, when he hit me, like fucking hit me, he fucking hit me. And I just, I thought, this is it. What, what are you doing? You're smacking me. Then you're going to shoot me. What are you doing? You know what I mean? And then I turned, I turned, I, I told myself never to turn. But I had, when I hit, when he hit me across the face, I turned. And then I seen his eyes and he seen me and it was just like, then he gave me another fucking hit to the face. How much was that day a big realisation that what you were actually going to do? Um, oof. It was massive after it, but before it, I didn't think. Uh, like, But I, be after it, that's why I went for my walk. I, I tried to clear my head. But, you know, I went back. I remember, I, I remember I went for a walk pretending that I went to work and to come home and I just walked into where my daughter was asleep in her room. And, you know, I, I got the privilege to see her again. You know what I mean? But Because I didn't think I was ever going to see her again. You know what I mean? That's that, that's it's a it's a weird feeling when you want to take your life, bro. It's um because you you've got one side of your head saying do it, and the other side saying don't do it. But the other side that's saying do it always wins. Telling you the right, telling you telling you the reasons why you should do it. What happened to your life after that? Was that try to get it back into normality, or were you thinking about doing it again? Um, I I broke up uh, with with my, my wife then we broke up um i kind of moved in with a, with a long friend a good friend who actually helped me a lot um get me back on track and it um i still you know as i said I, I stayed with john but i think it helped me getting out of that circle again getting i was i was stuck with as i said with my ex-wife and there was a lot of pressure there and it was media stuff too and then when i went to live with my mate he was there for me every fucking day talking to me. Sometimes he'd even turn up for work. It went, when I was going to, to, as I said, well, I used to look after King's Cross by myself and walk around, kick people out. He sometimes just came and sat in his car just so he could be there in case something happened to me. And that's what got me probably um, from Cohen insane. You know what I mean? It, it kind of woke me up and pushed myself to be the person I am today. Otherwise, I think I would have just I think I just would have fucking tried to do it again. See, when the relationship, your mum breaks down and then you're breaking up with your missus, did you see the resemblance of it was another woman leaving? <laughs> um, no. Um, it was more, it was different different circumstances that I, I left um, my ex. Um, so it was, my mother was different. You know, she she was just on to me about working for John. And this is not me telling me every time I turned up, this is not my son who's sitting in front of me. You talk differently. You act differently. Why you always got to be this person who, whoever, who the media portray? You're not that person. Whereas with her, it was just like, I just felt like I, I wasn't a partner. I was I was just, I was nobody. You know what I mean? And I didn't like that. I was just, yeah, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the father of, of our kid. That's it. That's all I felt. There was no, there was no love there. So that's why I, I became empty because I had no one to talk to, bro. Like when I needed someone to talk to, I had no one. I remember going to her one day and I said to her, you know, I, I, um, I'm depressed. I feel fucked. And she laughed at me. So how are you supposed to go to someone when you fucking need help and they laugh at you? You know what I mean? So you end up talking to yourself. And that, as I said, when you talk to yourself, that fucking dickhead on this side wins all the time. So you become more reserved and you don't want to, you felt embarrassed yeah. speaking out about it in case anybody yeah. else laughed. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go and tell anybody in our circle of friends with, with John. Oh, fuck. You think I'll do that? No, I keep it in. I put the image on that I need to when I go to work. I'd keep it to myself. When I leave work and I've got my own time then, that's when it all fucking starts to fucking kick in. Want to leave here because the, the world does it is such a beautiful place, but sometimes we don't see it. Do you think you, you you then start to believe in your own hype though, being in the news and being in the newspapers and having that power, where you then become in so much in your own bubble, you don't actually know what's going out in the real world, the outside world? Yeah. Because all that's just a big game. It's just a big fucked up game of 
yeah. misery and pain. There's nothing positive comes from that life, even though sometimes we think this is a life, there's a bit of money, a bit of power, everybody knows who I am, but it's all bullshit when you break it down. Did you kind of believe your own hype or who you were? And yeah. When yeah. Not really, is that a big yeah. part of your life? Not really yeah. wanting to talk because you thought, this yeah. is who I am, this big, strong, powerful man, not realise you were breaking inside. Yeah, I had to be. I had to always put my persona up. I always had to put my image up. When I left that front door of mine, uh, my image was put on straight away. If I went to a, if I went out with the boys, you know, like even even old uh, football mates, I had to put on an image. I couldn't be Neil who I used to be, you know, because I always felt my, the eyes were on me all the time, who I was, who I worked for. Everyone knew who I was. So I always had to put that image on every fucking day. I still sometimes have to. I still feel like sometimes our eyes are on me. Yeah, I'm a bit more relaxed now, but and I don't give a shit. You know what I mean? Like, I'll try and be who I am. But the thing is, I was always judged, and I thought, fuck, I, you know what I mean? I just want to be me. I come home tired. You know what I mean? It's it's tiring. You know what I mean? Like, you're, you're putting on this image, standing there for fucking sometimes 12 hours, you know, maybe, maybe it's, it's two days, three days in a row, and it's like, fuck, you just want to relax, man. Sometimes my escape was the gym. Yeah, when could you ever be yourself, if you could? When I was at home by myself. When I was at home and there was no one there, that's that was me. All, all with my mate. As I said, I lived with uh, in Bondi. I could be myself with him. You know what I mean? But other than that, <laughs> as soon as I left that front door, I had to be the person who everyone knew was John Abrams' bodyguard. Were you a debt collector as well? I've done a bit of debt collecting. Yeah. I wasn't known for the, the map. That was not, not the massive thing of me being known as, but yeah, I have done some. What was that like for you? Easy. Did you have that power <laughs> again? Big, big guys. What are you six feet four, Neil? Uh, yeah, six four. Yeah. Right, so you're a big fucking unit, 18, 19 stone. You must've had that presence where people were just happy to give you, give up what they owed. Yeah, it was, it was, it was easy. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people that I, when I did go there collecting, um, they either knew who I was or I didn't bullshit. I'd, I'd tell them who I was, you know what I mean? Because I, I wasn't there to fucking mess around and fucking talk, you know, for ages. But I just wanted to know when you're going to pay, if you're going to pay, let me get the fuck out of you. You know what I mean? And, you know, there's been some times when, you know, people want to kind of do a bit of a rumble, but I was happy for that. But as I said, um, it's got me in trouble sometimes, but um, it was it was an easy job, put it that way. But I didn't like it. I never, I wasn't really a fan of being a debt collector. What's the worst things you've seen as being a bouncer? I would say, um, I'd say the night that we had to drive by at DCMs when I seen everyone just come out the club and they got shot, and they were, you know, they 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 ran out the club thinking, you know, you know, running out, running down to go to either get a taxi, and as they run out, you just see the the limb body just get shot and they put on the floor. That that's always stuck in my head. And I was, I was, I, I remember because I was putting the bollards away and it all happened and it just, everything happened in slow motion. And, and, it, and to this, this day, I can just remember my hand was on the bollard and I'm just looking and I just see people just getting shot and the the, the, the sound of the bullets just hitting the, um, the glass. Why do you think you're still alive today? Come as a lucky bastard. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking had to have been mate with so many shootings, mate. <laughs> You know what? I, I, sometimes I, I look back and I go, you know, okay, I am. I have been lucky. Don't go, don't get me wrong. I've been lucky, but a lot of people um, I showed a lot of respect to. You know what I mean? I didn't go around trying to be somebody that I wasn't. You know what I mean? I I, I was respectful and I gave respect back if you give me respect to. Um, yeah, I was firm, but I was supposed to be. But I didn't go around trying to be a wannabe. I didn't try and be a hard can. I just said, bro, this is how it is. If you fuck with me, this is what's going to happen. You know what I mean? And that's how it always was. And I'd shake your hand after it. You know what I mean? I didn't go looking for fights. I'd finish them. You know what I mean? Someone to start them, I finish it. Simple as that. So how did that kid from Liverpool go into Australia for a better life, then become Australia's most wanted? All over the news, all over the newspapers. Um... That was just a, a, a debt collecting job that was went fucking totally wrong. Um, the guy, the guy owned five hundred k. I got offered the job. Um, I didn't, I didn't take it on to to do any rough shit. I just said, if you've got the paperwork, I'll do it. I was already out the scene. 
And um, but I knew the guy, and he told me his father and his father's business partner were going to lose everything if this fellow wasn't found because he's a con artist. And I just said, if you've got paperwork, I'll find him, and I'll see what he, I can do for you. Um, so they got all the paperwork down. They they done some homework for me. They found out he was in a place uh, doing a conference um, down in Coffs Harbour. And I said, all right, um, let's go down. I'll see what he's got to say. So I went down and straight away, you know, when I introduced myself, I just, you know, I said, listen, mate, um, I've come to see what's going on with this. Apparently you owe this person money. Straight away, he lied to me twice. So I knew he was already bullshit because I had the paperwork in front of me, what he signed and everything that he's done with these people. So he, he kept telling me, no, um, I don't know who you're talking about. Never heard them before. So on the third time, I said, mate, listen, I'm going to say this once to you. I said, if you bullshit me here, we're going to have a different kind of uh, situation happening here. I said, because I've got all the paperwork and I put it all from him. I said, I've got all the paperwork right here in front of me, bro. I said, so let's ask you again. Do you know who these people are? Straight away, his face changed and he says, yes, I do. He says, but can we talk later? So we talked later. We, he went back into the conference. I waited around. Now, the guy who I was with, who drove me up there, was was the son of the father who and the business partner who owed the money. You know, he wanted the money back. So when the guy came out, I'm standing there and I'm talking to him. Everything was going sweet. Mate, maybe we can come up to an arrangement. Uh, this and that. I'm just at a conference. I said, yeah, no worries. I said, but can you just do me a favor? I said, um, just show me that I've seen you and go, can you just go to the ATM and show me that, you know, um, yeah, a balance of your bank account. You know what I mean? Just so I can go back to the people and just show them. My, he was happy to go that. Yeah, no, no worries, mate. I'll go and do that for you. So I didn't know that the guy who was with me went to the fucking bank, uh, to the ATM with him and got and told him to take money out without me fucking knowing. Now he's put it on him, asked him to take money out. Now when he, when he tells you, when he, when I finally found out off the coppers how much he took, it was, I think it was about $800, which is, I don't know, about 400 pounds back home. Is it something like that? 400 pounds? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't know a fucking thing about it, right? So when I, when I've when the coppers have come looking for me and all this is finished, apparently this guy went to the coppers as soon as he finished because he didn't tell me that the um, my mate who drove me there put it on him. He didn't tell me nothing. He just said, um, showed me the thing. And I went, fine, mate. And I was I was happy. You know what I mean? And the guy, the guy didn't tell me on the way home when we were driving home that he put it on him. It was only when like, the coppers came looking for me and he apparently, they got him and arrested him and they came look, uh, to look for me. So I handed myself in that they said, um, oh, your, your mate took money off him. I said, well, it's news to me because I don't fucking know about anything. How much did he take off him? He, he took about $800 off him, but he gave him $50 back. I said, what did he give him $50 back for? He said, so he could get petrol on. I said, well, put, I wouldn't, doesn't sound like I'd do that. I said, mate, I've got a book out. I'm doing all this. Do I really look like I need fucking $800? I said, so I got it. They were happy with my statement. And um, I left the police station, went home. Four and a half years went past. I had nothing. And then all of a sudden, the Daily Telegraph um, rang me up on a Sunday afternoon. And they said, uh, is this Neil Cummins? And I said, yeah. He said, uh, we want to do a story on you. And I said, what about? Now, at the time, John, John and his family um, his brothers were in the news for something that happened in Dubai. And um, I thought they wanted to get get a story on what was going on with John's brothers. And I said, listen, I don't want to talk. I'm not interested. And they said, no, it's about you. I said, uh, as of tomorrow, you're Australia's most wanted fugitive. And I said, why is that? And they just go, when they when they brought up um, about Kof Saba, and you straight away, oh, fuck, you know what I mean? I knew what it was. I said, listen, I don't want to talk anymore. Uh, uh, that's it. Put the phone down. I was fucking shit myself. You know what I mean? Like, Tomorrow, I was all I could think of, and I remember I was in the shopping centre. I'm going to be Australia's most wanted. Is this fucking true or not? I rang up my uh, my solicitor, and he was on a fucking. I couldn't get in touch with him. I could only message him, and um, he was on a fucking boat cruise. And um, he told me not to panic. He says that's fucking bullshit. Whatever. Don't believe him. I said, mate, I was panicking. I was fucking panicking. And then he says, listen, if you're that worried, I dock tomorrow morning. Um, go and hide in a hotel. And I said, ah, oh, fuck, no, you know what? I'll, I don't worry. I, I should be all right. The next day, I was all over the fucking news. Like, I'm talking like I couldn't escape anything. Five channels had me fucking on every time. 
as the do not approach him. He, he is highly dangerous. I was on fucking uh, the first six pages of the fucking uh, newspapers all over everywhere in Australia. I couldn't fucking hide. But they were using me as a fucking, as a guinea pig to find another 20, 20 people who are pedophiles and murderers. I had, at this point in time, I don't have a fucking charge to my name. I got no fucking charge. I'm clean as a fucking whistle with a, with a few little minor fucking shit going on in my life. I, I remember ringing my sister. I said, have you seen the news? He goes, yeah, go and hide. Fucking hide. We'll go to, we'll, we'll hand yourself in tomorrow. All right. We, we need to think about this. So I went to a fucking um, a hotel. As I booked, as I checked in, I'm all over the, there's plasmas on top of the fucking, there's plasmas on top of the, the, the lifts to go up. There's, there's, there's my fucking mugshot with, uh, as it's on the news. I get in the lift, try and get up to, to the room straight away. Uh, I'll let someone else pay for the room so I can get up there. I forgot my, I remember I forgot all my clothes to get my fucking, uh, to hand myself in uh, the next day because I was in shorts and I thought, I don't want to hand myself in in shorts. I need to, if I'm going to hand myself in, I know this, I don't know why I thought this, but I just knew there was going to be media there. I just thought, I can't be looking like a tosser in shorts and shit. I said, I need to go back and get fucking clothes. Went back to get clothes, couldn't get up my fucking, by the time I got back to my fucking house, the house had already been fucking blocked off and raided. So my neighbors had already given me up. Um, I went back to the hotel. I had to go to a fucking 24-hour fucking Kmart to get some clothes to look decent for the next day. Um, I just stayed in my room. And I remember telling my sister, what do I do? He says, we meet at 11 o'clock. You will hand yourself in to Bearwood Police Station. And let's just go from there. And I remember the next morning, it was just like, I remember looking at my two kids and I just thought, this is it. They finally got something on me to put me away. You know what I mean? And I just thought, I'm not going to see my kids again. This is this is mad. This is massive. You know what I mean? I like fucking. I'm all over the fucking news. I went down to the buffet breakfast at the hotel. I couldn't even stay there for more than five minutes because everyone had the fucking paper in front of me with me on the front page. I was even, you know, I had to get out of there. So I went. I remember going to the police station, waiting outside. There was a park outside the police station. I waited there for an hour till my fucking solicitor turned up. The walk to that police station to this day felt like the longest fucking walk ever. And I remember going in and I turned to my kids in the car and watched them drive away, thinking I'm not going to get released. The coppers thought they fucking had, they won the lotto when I walked in. They, they once one seen me at the front desk, there was probably about eight turned up to fucking see, see me walk in. Uh, court went for about maybe, you know, even before court, like when I when I was put in the cells um, downstairs in the courts because um, I was trying to get bail, I remember they made me go naked, and um, they didn't ask me if, if I was affiliated with anybody. They just put me in, and they should they should have asked me because I could have gone into any any prison cell at the time, but they didn't, and they stripped me naked and kicked my clothes outside the the prison cell, and kicked them down the hallway, and then they did the, the two the two um, court um, prison guards said go outside and get your fucking clothes made me walk outside to get him stark naked and they didn't give a shit i remember just waiting there for hours and hours uh to see if i'd get bail when i finally got bail i just remember it was it was it was just a godsend like i just i actually just thought i wasn't going to get bail and i was going to stay in in there till my fucking court um case happened which i'm fucking glad it didn't because it went for four and a half years you know what i mean three i'm sorry three and a half years it went for and um uh i remember going home and i was just Everything came crashing down again. You know, when you, I did, I wasn't suicidal, but I just felt like I'd let my family down. Um, and I've been through a lot of shit when I was working for John, but to leave John and now become Australia's most wanted, I just felt like, how the fuck am I going to get out of this? You know what I mean? Like I was going up to court every fucking week. The, the, coppers, had, the coppers had nothing on me, but the fact is they had a gold nugget. That's how they. F I, I felt to them. We've got Neil Cummins. At last, we've got him. We have to find something on him to put him away. That's how it felt for the whole three and a half years. I was turning up a call, and I could tell they had nothing. My solicitor told them, they've got fuck all on you. But they're dragging it and dragging it, trying to find something. And eventually, they tried to get the guy who I did, uh, was going to help get the money back. They were going to bring him in to give him a better, um, a le a less sentence to fucking put it on me. But he wouldn't come into court. He told me, I shit myself, Neil. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do that to you. But they actually asked him. 
to change his fucking thing and come in and say that I was the main person. I, it was my job. It wasn't my job. I I went for work for him. You know what I mean? It's it was the that that is the second lowest point of my life. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've I've I can say that being on shows most wanted has pushed me to to what I've I've, I've achieved at the moment because I used it in the media to gain stuff, you know, like media coverage, my podcast coverage and all that kind of stuff. But at the time, everyone I everyone hated me. You know, and I, I lost a lot of friends again. And it was just another fucking way of cooking. I, I just got myself established and I was I was in a in a good place. And then no one wants to know me. I was doing personal training at the time and I lost every fucking client. No one wants to fucking know me. You know what I mean? They they just took it for me. Uh, whatever the media said was fucking true. You know what I mean? And I thought everybody knew that. I was, oh, I'm Johnny Abrams' bodyguard. But now it was like, well, you're Johnny Abrams' bodyguard and you're the most wanted and you've been on TV with pedophiles and murderers. Are you a murderer, Neil? No, I'd never murder him. But they were, they were using my profile to find the murderers, to find the profile, uh, the pedophiles. So it, it put me in a fucking rut again where, fucking hell, like, how am I going to get out of this one? For three and a half years, I had no fucking friends, mate. No one's going to fucking know me. Why did it resurface after four years of actually trying to get the money back? What happened? They just dragged the court on for ages. That's all they did. They Because they couldn't find nothing on me. How long were you on the run for? Uh, well, I didn't even know I was on the run, mate. I didn't know I was on the run. So like, that, that, but that was, so it was from when, when I first handed myself in, coming back from Coffs Harbour, um, that was the actual, the day later, four and a half years later. So they reckon they could not find me, yet I had a public social media. You could find me on social media. All you have to do is Google my name and I would come up on fucking, on, um, on Instagram. But you know what I mean? But they couldn't find me for four and a half years, they reckon. But as soon as, as soon as they hit the media, they knew what there were two gyms I went to. They knew straight away what gyms I went to. They knew where I hung out. You know what I mean? That like I just don't understand. Uh, it was a massive operation, but um, it killed my life because See, the, like yeah, my the, son's seen it. My son's seen it, and it, and to this day he's still got anxiety from from what the coppers and what he what he's seen. You know what I mean? Like he, he was shit scared. Like he to see your dad. How like my son's now what eleven. Um, 2017. So you're looking about five, six years ago. He was traumatized. He didn't understand what, what, why are they saying this to you, Dad, on TV? You know what I mean? When I walked into the police station, I had seven coppers push, grab me against the wall. I walked in there to give myself up. They didn't care. I took my son, thinking, well, if I take my family here, they're not going to rough me up. They wouldn't rough me up in front of my kids, but they fucking did. They all waited for me at the top of the stairs in fucking the police station, and they fucking grabbed me. So he had to see it. You know what I mean? And why are they why are they doing this to you, Dad? Why are they talking like this? Are you a murderer, Dad? You haven't killed anyone, have you, Dad? You know what I mean? And then he he had to come in. I had to sign in every day, sign into the police station every day. That was my bail conditions. So every time I picked my kids up from school, they had to come with me while I signed in every day for three and a half years. See, the guy who took the eight hundred dollars did he get a sentence? He got um uh, tw uh, uh section ten. And they're 12, 12 months good behavior. Mm -hmm. What was why did you leave John? Didn't see the loyalty anymore. I didn't, I didn't see, I didn't like the people. People get a lot uh, in that circle, you you see a lot of jealousy. And um a lot of people were jealous of me and how close I was to John and his family. And I could hear the talk all the time. You know what I mean? And I, and there was a few people who came back into the circle who went to other gangs. And then came back to be with us. And one one person in particular who put a gun, who pulled a gun out on me um, because I wouldn't let him into one of John's nightclubs. And then all of a sudden he's walking with us again. And I just turned around to John. I can't do this. You know what I mean? I, I'm not going to walk with somebody who's pulled a gun on me. You know what I mean? Two, like two or three years ago. Now I've got to walk with him. And there was a lot of people in there who were, you know, jealous of how I was with John. And they were, you know, going to the sly remarks. Then then one, one person started turning around to me and saying, you oh, know, I'm an informer. Like, what the fuck? Like, I'm the last person who would be an informer. You know what I mean? It's just, it got to me so much. I just went, I'm not doing this no more. I was getting married. And at the time, I just went, that's it, man. I'm, I'm fucking over this. And John, even John, like, kept saying to me, like, you want to get out? I said, no. But then this one time, I just went, I've had enough. And I just didn't go back. That's it. 
Was it easy to and leave or do you become a target? Was, nah, it was easy. It no was pressure it, it from was anybody else because of the information that you might have had on the family? Nah, nah it wasn't it wasn't that it wasn't it wasn't like that. It, it was just like that's it. I'm 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 done. I'm I'm gone. Uh, and I, that's it. I just I'm just gonna be the family man now. That's it. I'm, uh, and there was no re repercussions, there was no nothing. I was just out. But I think I think deep down, I think they thought I was gonna come back. You know, he'll be back. You know what I mean? I think he just needs a couple of weeks off or a couple of months off. But nah, I don't. I don't ever go back. Not not in anything I do. It's I always just go forward. If I, if I regret it, I regret it later. But I don't go back. That's that's just how I've been. So you left, and then you wrote a book. Is that correct? Yeah, I wrote a book. What I was the book called? The book was called The Muscle. Um, that was my nickname um, when I worked for for John around King's Cross. And um, I just, I was just, yeah, I just thought, you know, I was getting stopped all the time. Um, before I was out of having a drink and that, and I just thought, you know what? I'm just going to write a book. I'm sick of people stopping me to ask for fucking questions. And I always kept it. It's like a, it's like a log. I used to keep a log all the time when I worked for John. I don't know why I did it. Um, I just did. And anything that happened, I used to log it down on this piece of paper, which was this booklet all the time. Didn't matter if it was boring. I just logged down. This is what happened. I think it's just from back when I was a doorman, I used to do that all the time in case anything came to bite me on the ass later on. And I just, and I used to all my points from all that to write my book. How was it when the book was going out? Were you nervous? Yeah, a little bit to see what fucking, um, what I get back from people. I didn't get nothing back actually. It was all, it was all good. Um, you know, John actually, I remember John, um, Give me a phone call. Actually, it was a message. And then he, then we had a phone call. He said, like, are you writing a book? And I said, yeah. And he goes, what's it about? And I just said, it's about me. And he just goes, what do you mean it's about you? And then I said, it was about me and looking after you and my life in the underworld and looking after you. And he just goes, yeah, but what do you mean? And I, when he said that, I kind of stopped and went, what do you mean? It's about me. And then I, I just remember he said to me, just remember, tell everyone, remember to write that I lead from the front. So that's how I was, you know what I mean? That's how the conversation ended. I don't know of how many books. I got told he bought seven books. To this day, I don't know. He's never told me. He's never said, he's never came up to me and goes, I love your book. He, he's, a, he's a person that doesn't show um, a lot of like emotion. You know what I mean? He was not going to come up to you and pat you on the back and say, well done. You know what I mean? He might say it to someone afar and then they have to tell you. But I've never got any gratitude to say, listen, you, you, you know, loved what you did for me. That, that'll never happen you know what I mean but the higher you're up in the chain the less emotion you'll show because you need to be ruthless especially exactly in the right. other world you can't show emotion you show emotion you show weakness that's the yeah. way they'll see it but you must have yeah. made him nervous he must oh, have been on edge about the book he, he he was he was on edge because he was wondering what I was going to write you know what I mean but as I said to him listen I've got this is about me not about you you know what I mean this is about my it's about my story telling it, it situations what I've been through I'm not here to tell uh, everyone about the situation that you've done. You know what I mean? If I was there involved, then I'll say in my how I how I coped with it. But I'm not here to fucking open cans of worms. You know what I mean? And that's how it's always been. Even on my podcast, I'm not there to open can of worms. I'm there to say this is my life and this is what's happened. You know what I mean? So yeah. you get strength from that, eventually putting your side of the story across and showing who you were, the stuff that you went through. Was he ever? Did he ever try and stop the book? Put the blockers no. on it? No. At the end of the day, I think he knew that I, I you know, when I said when I said my word, I mean my word. You know what I mean? And I wasn't. Got, I'm not there to fucking um, put the family down, put him down. And I never have. And he knows that. I think that's why he trusted me when I when I did the book. Do you ever feel used, Neil? Oh yeah, yeah. I always feel used, bro. Always feel used. Even to this day, I still feel used. I still feel that people ring me up and just want want me to hang around with them or come for a drink with them. Or if I'm in the if I'm in the limelight or I'm one day, you know, from the paper next day or I'm doing something, I get phone calls. I haven't heard of people for a while and they said, let's go and hang out. I know I'm getting used, bro. I've seen it. Even well, back in the days, well, I know I was getting used. It's my presence. It's it's you know, have Neil around. Fuck, we'll get in everywhere. Have Neil around, we'll get this. Have Neil around, we'll get that. You know what I mean? No one will fuck with us if Neil's around. When are you at your happiest? When I'm with my two boys. Do, they, do you worry that they could potentially see your life and try and 
go down that same path? Not my not my oldest one, um, but my youngest one, um, London. Um, he tells everybody he's my bodyguard, and um, you know he 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 he's now got to an age because he's eight, and he's. I want to be like you, Dad. You know what I mean. I, I want to be. I don't, I know he likes. I just I tell him I don't want him that. Just play soccer, but he says no, Dad. No one's going to mess with you, and that's what scares me. Because he is a kind of like a for for his age, he's not a little hardy, but he's he's just the fact of like I think he just looks up and he he's excited about what I'm doing. He doesn't really know what he's saying in a way, in a way, but he's the one who scares me the most. Do you see a lot of yourself in him? Yeah, yeah. My other my other son's too placid, and as I said, he's seen a lot, which scared him. London is more the fighter. <clears throat> And doesn't take shit off no one, and um, I see that, and um, yeah, that scares me because I'm trying to get him out that mode because I don't, you know, he's, I don't want him in that mode when he gets into his teens. Um, but yeah, that he's the one I'm I'm worried about. That's a great little name, London. Where did you get that from? I wanted my kids to have um, unique names, and as I said, I couldn't I couldn't name him fucking Liverpool, so I had to fucking <laughs> <laughs> stop. So as I said, I got um, I had I, I I was going through kind of places in in England, and I just thought, you know what, I don't mind London, even though I'm fucking not from down there. But um, I like that, and as I said, my other my other kids called Cruz. So like, um, yeah, I just wanted unique names for them. Mm -hmm. So see, going through all that and all the changes, you write your book, life's going great. You get the extortion charges, you become Australia's most wanted. What happened at the end of that? Um. I, after I got after I I, I knew I, I wasn't going to to jail, um, and I got a kind of kind of off with the charges with a bit with just a you know a community service fifty I think it was a fifty hours, and then I got you know eighteen months suspended sentence. Um, I just kind of like took a a couple of months to just get myself my burdens right because that took a, a a big toll on me. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I, I felt like I lost weight. I was going to I was going to court. I was off the gear because I didn't want to look intimidating to the judge. So I, I actually turned up sometimes with glasses on. I don't even fucking need glasses. With my hair parted, even like yours, I was going to jail like that. <laughs> so so I, I didn't look like Neil intimidation. Everyone knows, and it didn't work because fucking you know what I mean. I just, but I just I just thought you know let, I've got to do something different with my life. I tried to get out of it, went back to uh, personal training, didn't happen. I wasn't into it. Um, and I just started to do podcasts. I just want, let's talk about things. You know what I mean? Let's bring people on who can talk, who've been in the same shit that I have or even worse. And it actually helped um, talking to people with their situations. And um, I actually enjoy it um, because then it's not all about me and I can hear someone else who's got more going on in their life and they've been in more shit than what I have I thought I was in you know what I mean and it's it's actually it's funny I've always wanted as I said before I've never had that person to talk to but when I do my podcast I feel like I have all my guests come on and I have the people to talk to it's it's hard to explain I just um I get I get I get off on it um because I've missed a certain part, part of my life where I had no one to talk to and when I, they're talking to me about their problems I feel like I'm helping them even though some of them have been helped or some of them aren't, you know, I can, I feel like I can give them advice. And, um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, uh, the podcast has really helped me a lot. Yeah. That's the beautiful thing about podcasts. A lot of people have got podcasts now, but the ones who are hard and the ones who are raw and real, they're like therapy sessions, not just for you, for me, for yeah. other people listening. People go, fuck me. Like, I feel that way. He's come out. To, and that's the, the good thing is to try and leave things, not to inspire people, but to, to show people that they're not alone. A big yeah. hard man like yourself, Neil, six feet four, fucking built like a brick shit house, then has the suicidal thoughts as well, who nobody would have thought, I can't believe he's struggling because you put on the persona and the act and as soon as you leave the house, it's the big boy pants and man up. It doesn't have to be this way. Listen, it's a very important to talk. It's a, it's a must to try and heal anything in life and to try and make yourself feel better. But also there comes a stage where... Sometimes talking 
is too much where you've just actually got to put things into action. Exercise is key in my own opinion to try and numb any pain and try and heal any pain is just getting out and exercising. Once you've got the natural chemicals, you're actually seeing the world a bit differently and plus you can then grow some confidence to then make better decisions and my own yeah. personal opinion. What is your podcast, Neil, so we can plug it and get people on it? Um, it's Secrets of the Underworld. Um, that's all it is, Secrets of the Underworld. Of, um, Neil Cummins. So that's that's my podcast at the moment. So yeah. where can people get it? Watch on, on it's it's you know, on uh, all um, platforms. It's on every platform that you go into listen to Spotify, Apple, all of it. So yeah, it's on everywhere. We will leave the links in the description. You talked about your son there. Your son's in. You got quite a, a bit emotional. Can Did I you that? I try. I try. To, I try to keep that away. Then sorry. No, no. That's <laughs> listen. That's a good thing. When your dad try to give you advice if you'd seen your son London going through the same things try to protect somebody getting shot at you kind of see he's, he's losing touch of who his true identity is do you understand now why your dad was trying to do what he was trying to do I do I I, I do because um, and I it's funny how I still go back to the day he left me in the car and, and he says don't come back um, get 12 months out of it and come back a different person for a holiday but don't come back and want to be with your mates and um i just remember the talk but I, I, you know what when you when dad's trying to be dads and you don't want to listen to them and because my dad was in the nightclub scene and he, he knew a lot of people i blocked them out like i blame my dad sometimes for showing me these people and sometimes bringing me to his meetings you know what i mean like i used to get locked up in a cupboard by my fucking stepfather so i couldn't hear the deals that was going on you know what I mean? Or I'd be in the fucking the office of the nightclub and hearing them batter someone and fucking um, put their heads against the wall. You know what I mean? Why take me there and let me see it all and then try and stop me from going in it? You know what I mean? You've you've shown me, you've opened a door, um, and yeah, uh, not that I want to fucking knock people out. I wasn't my image, but as I said, I looked up to my dad. And I knew no one would fuck with my dad. I looked up to my uncle. No one would fuck with my uncle. I wanted that power. I could never get that power when I was in England. When I came here, I I, I drove to get that power. And once I got that, that as I said, my, my security license and I started working on that door, once I was told I was the head doorman of a fucking club, then I started to work on my fucking profile of being somebody that you don't fuck with. And that's how it all started with me. I didn't care who you were, James. I, I I took on main people in Sydney and didn't give a fuck. Do you miss that? Do I miss it? Mm -hmm. um, not the not the door work. The door work, work was easy for me. That I could. It was a piece of shit. But the fact is that I miss looking after John because right? it was in me. As I said, it, I, that to me was um, was another level. You know, and I, as I said to everybody, the first time I met Tongue and Sam, I told myself and I told the doorman who was next to me, I'm going to get his job. I want that job. And that was the first time I met him. I want that job. And I got it. I, meant sure, I made sure I got that fucking job. What if John phones up now and says, look, come with me for another year? Nah. Told you, not, not, not with my kids now. I wouldn't want them to see um, what I used to do or what could happen. And now... Nowadays, John's, it's not like it was back then. John's, John's very, like, um, the family aren't, aren't, as, aren't as big as what they used to be. You know what I mean? They're still big, but they're out of the scene kind of thing. There's other families coming forward now. You know what I mean? So to me, I, he doesn't need a bodyguard anymore. What do you think back looking back in your life? I've got no regrets, put it that way. But I wish I'd have gone through a few of it situations and and done them a bit different than what i did you know what i mean like uh, some people i wish i could apologize to um uh the way i have to act in, in ways of situations um but i would never change anything there's nothing i would change because if i changed anything i wouldn't be the person i am now so it's a, to me it's a learning curve how's life now life's good as i said life life's very good for me now as I, i'm doing a lot of tv my podcast um you know i've got a radio show coming on soon i'm writing two more books um you know I, i'm just a, a normal fucking dad now you know what i mean it, but i still won't take shit but the thing is 
I'm not at that level anymore. You know what I mean? I enjoy telling people, you know, my life, writing about my life. And as I said, that's uh, the, my podcast is is everything to me at the moment. Yeah, it just keeps matching it then, brother. What about plans for the future? Where do you see yourself? Where do I see myself? Um, I just see myself hopefully support my kids. That's all I want to do. I, I don't see myself doing anything else. You know what I mean? I'd love to do a, a clothes label, but everyone's on that at the moment. And I don't really, I don't like following suit. So, but um, yeah, my kids are going over to England soon to play um, football. Um, they've got trials with Manchester United. So I'm hoping to come over there this year and um, watch them do that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's unbelievable for the life that you led to what you're doing now. I always say this, what make, I know there's a lot of talk about masculinity and being alpha. The most masculine thing and alpha thing you can do is be a good father, be a good husband, be a good boyfriend. No matter what level of income you have, as long as you're doing that, you're winning in life because everything else is bullshit. Neil, you've lived that life, you've felt it. You know the destruction it causes, not just internally within you but the people around you and that's the heartbreaking thing because i can see you're a good guy a sensitive guy who tries to do the right thing sometimes it's not the right thing but in your mind it is for the loyalty that you have for others and sometimes that can be manipulated with those in power i've interviewed enough men who i know are staunch who are solid 100 percent, who would die for other people but the sad thing is they wouldn't die for them yeah very true very true how does people buy your book, Neil? How do they get your podcast? Just plug everything, your social medias. Yeah, just on my social medias. Everything's on my social media. So yeah, um, through there. Or they, like my book, you can get through. It was through um, WH, uh, WH Smith. You could get it through there. But otherwise, it's just online. And yeah, you can get my book through there. The Muslim. Yeah. For anybody watching who's struggling right now mentally, what advice would you have for them? Not to li not to listen to the demons in your head. That's one thing because that's what I did for years. Listen to the demons um, is to be more strong um, and do talk up because that was the problem for me. I didn't come forward and talk. I thought I, um, if I talked, I'd get laughed at, and um, that was the main thing for me coming forward and actually talking to a mate and explaining my situation. And then once I knew that that person was listening to me, I opened up a lot, and when I opened up a lot. It, everything went out from my head and I relaxed and it was good to have that person there. You know what I mean? Like, as I, as you said before, like there's been times when I think I want to talk to someone, but as I said, I went to someone and they laughed at me and that when, when someone laughs at you, then you, you, you build up more shit in your head thinking, well, maybe it is right that I, I have to end my life. Maybe it is because if they think it's funny, well, no one can help me. You know what I mean? And as I said, I, I have time now to when someone's needs someone to talk to. I've I've always picked up the phone, even if it's midnight or one o'clock in the morning. You know what I mean? Because you never know if that's they're like you. And all I can say is just come forward. I always say it to everybody, come forward, because if you don't, you might regret it. You know what I mean? And I, as I said, I um I I'd hate it to ever happen to me, touch what it doesn't, but um, I'd never want to see a mate who in the same situation that I've had and not have anyone to talk to. That's the hardest thing, um, to build up and just sit there and go through, what should you do? Do I kill myself? Do I not? Am I good enough for them or not? And you know, you are deep down or, you know, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing, but the thing is you don't know who to talk to. And as I said, me being staunch and me being whatever I am, my persona I can't, I couldn't go to anyone because I'm John Abraham's bodyguard. But they'd laugh at me. You know what I mean? And, I, and I've seen so many people come forward in the past fucking four years. And I, and we, we've, we now talk about shit. We have a laugh about shit. And, um, but back in the day, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have done that. Yeah. But fair play, listen, for totally changing your life and try to be a better father and owning your mistakes it takes courage to be speaking out it takes courage to admit your fuck ups and understanding okay maybe I was a bit of a loose cannon there where I should have done better but we all live and learn and there's not many people actually own their fuck ups you're clearly doing that you've got your podcast hopefully you get another couple of books out and just fucking make money off the past make money off planning for the future and that's what it's all about to keep your family in a good place and 
like I says earlier, only thing we can be is try and be a better dad than we were yesterday. I'm still learning. My kids are 12 and 13. I've got another one on the way. I believe I'll get it better, right? Right. This time, because I understand it, there's no manual really for a man how to be yeah. a dad. And it's that's the hard thing because as me, I'm very controlling. I'm always trying to please as well. And But I think I'll understand it more now. It's took me, it took me probably nine, ten years to understand what it's actually like to be a dad and try to be more sensitive towards it instead of just get up and get on with it. So, yeah, it's a beautiful thing to be a good father and that's all it's about for me now is family and fuck everybody else. I'm not asked. I'm not asked what people say. I'm not asked what others do. But if people are my friend, I'll genuinely always help them a million percent. I believe my name's strong out there where I've got a lot of trust and love behind us as well. But I used to, I used to listen to my haters a lot and that was my biggest problem. I used to listen to the haters on, on, on social and think that they were right all the time. And that's what, what it took me a while to get my head around that. I judge myself by saying, are they right? Uh, are they, they had to, uh, if they turn around and say to me, you fucking never done this, or you ain't John Abraham's bodyguard, or you fucking never got shot, or you haven't, you're not a real gangster. I'd, I'd think they tell, I start believing them and believing them and believing them every time instead of just fucking shutting it off. You know what I mean? And that was, that was one of my biggest problems for years, listening to all these fuckers. Yeah, and that's I, I, because, I, yeah, that's like a self-esteem, that's like a confidence in yourself to understand yeah. that you are bigger and better than them. Remember, these people who write those comments, they're struggling themselves. You've got to kind of feel sorry for those individuals. You're always going to get that, but it's it, as everything I've been doing over the last five years, you do become more thick-skinned to it. You don't really want to, because as a man, you still want to attack, but then you're just feeding it energy. Yeah. I don't even bother now. I'm just at a stage of my life, fuck everybody else. You can say what you want. You know what? If you think that about me, you're right. Yes, I am. It's just it as because feeding it energy just then makes you sad because being a sensitive man, we question everything. Are we doing the right things? Should we serve these people more? Or always trying to people please, but doing that, you're not trying to change your own life with a hundred percent yourself. Never mind trying to feed in everybody else. It's too fucking hard. So you've got to truly focus on yourself. Be a good individual. Try and learn from your mistakes. We're, all, we're human, Neil, we're always going to keep making mistakes, but as long as we can jump back quicker, instead of waiting at 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, life's too fucking precious and it's far too short to be worrying about fucking idiots. You've mm. came through too much to be even trying to retaliate to these people. Just live your life, do your thing, and gradually you do become stronger to what people say because you get an internal belief that, nah, you're wrong, because I know who I was five years ago, 10 years ago, and ain't the same person, so you can say what you want, do what you want, you're right go on with your day okay you're right bye bye that's it for me it's just try and concentrate on the positives but as a man it's hard because we're always trying to not impress but we're always trying to i don't know it's, it's a fucking weird thing it's like i just don't want to i always think that when they do that they've got one over me you know what i mean and i, I try and, and i do try and retaliate and i shouldn't retaliate because half, half the time i get the haters it's on a fake profile anyway yeah you know what no, I mean? that's pure that's pure ego neil yeah. It's, it's just to try and I'm not this way. Yeah. The more you do that, the more you then you then start believing it, and then they've got yeah. one up on you because they've stole yeah. your power. So fuck yeah. them, just go on with it. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? No, I'm 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 happy, bro. I'm I'm just I'm 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 honoured that you asked me to come on this show, bro. And it's uh, like as I said, I've I've been watching you for a while now, and I'm just um yeah, as I said, honoured that you brought me on, and I've been able to um, express my fucking uh, life uh, to everyone over there. You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm, 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 big thank you. Yeah, listen, this was a great conversation. This will do well, and I thoroughly enjoyed it myself, especially doing a Zoom as well. It's not as easy to connect yes. and get yeah. that emotion, but you showed the emotion where people can relate and go, fuck me, he's lived that life. So fair play to you for everything you're doing. Anything I can ever help with, you know, I'm a phone call away. But we'll leave all the links in the description, and we'll finish up on that note. Just keep doing what you're doing. And um that's it basically just yeah I look forward to seeing what you do for the future brother thanks James thanks very much yeah take care bro thanks man cheers mate thank cheers. you bye